At this time, our lesson study is going to be brought to us by our senior pastor at Central, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you very much, Debbie and singer Seth and Arlene for the music. Whenever I hear that song, Joy to the World, I always think about the dates when we would go out in gathering. Any of you ever do that before? And uh, in freezing weather, I remember my, I'd play guitar, and my hands would get so cold I couldn't change chords. So I thought, well, I can play a little flute, so I thought I'll bring my flute out. Well, that was a mistake, because your lips stick to it when it's freezing. <laughs> it's hard to play when your fingers are cold with a flute, because it never warms up. Anyway, but I, whenever I hear Joy to the World, I always think of singing that over and over and over again from door to door to door, and uh, holding on to that freezing flute. Happy memories. We have a very important study. It's the last in our series on Daniel. And it's Daniel chapter 12, mostly part of chapter 11. We have a free offer that goes with our program. And it's called The Last Night on Earth. It's a classic by Joe Cruz. If you'd like to order that, toll-free number 800-538-7275 and request offer number 101. Okay, our um, study is on Daniel number... Lesson number 13, it's the time of the end, or the end of time, and it's dealing with Daniel 11, verses 40 through the end of the book of Daniel. I hope you open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. You'll see I've got a board up here I may utilize in a little bit to show some of the time prophecies, and as well as I'll put them on the screen. But why don't we begin by going to verse 40 of Daniel 11. Now, I was talking to Pastor Mike earlier this week, who taught the previous lesson. He said, now, Doug, there was so much in there. I wondered how he was going to get through it. He said, I didn't get to the king of the north. I said, well, thanks a lot, because I've got so much in chapter 12. I don't know how I'm going to cover all that. But uh, tell you what, why don't we start with verse 40. And let me share something with you that I think will help you understand. It is not uncommon in Bible prophecy to begin a prophecy by talking about an earthly king and then the prophet transitions into the spiritual power behind the king. For instance, when it talks about Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 or in Ezekiel chapter 28, it begins by talking about the king of Tyre or the king of Babylon and then it, without breaking in the prophecy, it transitions into the devil who is behind that king. In Revelation, it talks about the dragon wanting to devour the baby as soon as he's born. Well, that's the devil. And then it's telling you, really, that pagan, who did the dragon use? The pagan kingdom of Rome, King Herod. And so sometimes there's a very thin veil between the earthly powers that are being manipulated by the spiritual powers. You understand? Daniel 11 is a very good example of that. The king of the north and south, and these battles that are taking place, it's talking about earthly powers when it begins, but by the time you get to the end, it's talking about the war between Christ and Satan. And it culminates in chapter 12 with Michael standing up. Now, I'll get to Michael in just a minute. But let's read verses 40 through the end of, verse, of chapter 11. Verse 40, chapter 11. And at the time of the end, well, we know what the context is, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. Any of you who know something about batteries know you've got a positive and a negative. If you look at the planet, you've got a north pole and a south pole with magnetic fields. And in the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, you can almost see uh, it's this titanic conflict at the end between the powers of good and evil and the earthly powers against the heavenly powers. But notice there's some also very specific things. The king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and he will enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries will be overthrown. Now, when you think of the glorious land, Oh, when you think of the Holy Land, what land do you think of? Israel. But is there a spiritual equivalent of Israel in the last days? God's people. When it says the beast power will sit in the temple of God showing himself he is God, was there a literal temple in the Old Testament? But is there a spiritual temple on earth now? 
The church is the temple of God over which the beast power sits. So keep in mind, there's a spiritual equivalent for these things. He'll enter the glorious land and many countries will be overthrown. But these will escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. It makes it sound like there's some alliance between Edom, Moab, Ammon, and the king of the north. Now, I need to pause here, and first of all, let me just confess right from the beginning. I don't understand all this. There's some things that are ringing true. It's like any of you put a, p a puzzle together, and you get a pretty good idea of what the picture is, but you know there's still some pieces missing. That will be our presentation today. I'm going to give you a lot of pieces. You may have to put in some on your own. Don't be dogmatic, because this is probably some of the most complex prophecies in the Bible. So much so that even Daniel said he didn't understand are the last prophecies in Daniel. Edom, Moab, Ammon, Libya, Egypt are mentioned in these verses. What do you notice about all those right away? Are they all Islamic countries today? I get a lot of questions. Doug, how can all that's happening in the world today and the conflict and the terrorism is there anything about some of these radical Islamic um, groups and a billion Islamic people in the world? What in prophecy is there? Do they have a role in last day prophecy? I think so. I think that's obvious. And just put that on the shelf that all of these countries that are mentioned after it says the time of the end are Islamic countries. One more thing to consider. Edom Moab and Ammon are the countries that surround Israel. One way, one reason they surround Israel is, well, where did the Edomites come from? Esau. Were they related to Abraham? Yes. Brother of Jacob. The Moabites and the Ammonites, children of Lot. Were they related to Abraham? Yes. Uh, Lot's children, of course. Nephews. The Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites had some things in common with the worship of the people of Israel. You often heard David call the Philistines these uncircumcised Philistines. They never said that about the Moabites, Edomites, and Ammonites because they practiced circumcision. They had some holdover, some similarities in the religion. Who is going to be the greatest enemy of God's people in the last days? Is it the blatant pagans or is it those who claim to believe in Jesus? I will submit to you that it's going to be a threefold union of relatives, our kin. You're going to have apostate Protestantism, and keep in mind, we are Protestants technically. Apostate Catholicism, or the Orthodox churches, and the charismatic movement with an emphasis on spiritualism, the Holy Spirit. And now, while there are many heaven-bound godly people in these movements, matter of fact, the greater part of Christ's true followers are in the fellowship of these churches. That's a quote from Great Controversy. There is going to be a threefold union of charismatics and Protestants and Catholics that are going to unite to support the beast power, the king of the north. Edom, Moab, Ammon were relatives of Israel. Now, did that make sense? Near kin, they joined together. And it says, um, he'll stretch out his hands against the countries and the hand of Egypt will not escape. And he will have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. And also, some have wondered, is this talking now about on a more specific level, the, the power was with oil, it seemed like in the last days. I've heard some people put that on there. I don't know. The Libyans and the Ethiopians will follow at his heels. The news from the east and the north will trouble him. Wait a second here. I'm, I'm forgetting something. I'm looking for it. Here, there it is. News from the north and the east shall trouble him. Therefore, he will go out with great fury. Doesn't it say that Satan has come down with great wrath? The king of the north is doing the same thing. It tells you there's a connection. To destroy and annihilate many. I mean, it's looking like except those days be short and no flesh will be saved. It's pretty serious at the end. Annihilate many. And he will plant the tent of his palace between the seas. Now between the seas does not mean the Atlantic Ocean. The, the Jews looked upon Jerusalem as the land between the seas because they had the Sea of Galilee and they had the 
uh, Mediterranean, and they thought of those as the land between the seas. I know to you, you look on a map, you say, well, they're not very big compared to the Pacific and the Atlantic, but you go there and it looks big enough for you if that's where you, you know, when you don't travel by airplane like we do in our age, it seemed pretty big. And so that was the land between the seas. And the glorious holy mountain, Mount Zion. You know, God's people are also called Mount Zion. His church. So here he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He plants his tabernacle. He tries to take control of God's church and force everybody to worship a certain way. Are you with me? But he will come to his end and no one will help him. And you read about that in Revelation 13, uh, 18 where it talks about the fall of Babylon. Okay, now quickly, Daniel chapter 12. You all praying for me? There's a lot i got to cover in here. There are more time prophecies in Daniel 12 than any other chapter in the Bible. At that time, Michael will stand up. Okay, who is Michael? You know, people talk about Michael the Archangel, and when you say that that is another one of the phrases that is used for Christ, uh, folks get all shook up by that. But um, it's very clear that this person is Christ. The name Michael means who is as God, Machiel. And Archangel means highest messenger. Only one person is called the Archangel in the Bible. Only one, Michael. I am not saying, I always get letters after I say this, you say that Jesus is an angel, you're a cult. He's the Son of God, he's divine. No, we're not saying Jesus is an angel. Nowhere is he called an angel. He's called the greatest messenger. That's what Archangel means. It's not applied to anyone else. This is not the teaching of our church. This is a very well-established old Protestant teaching. Let me give you a few quotes. Commentators, you can go read it for yourself. James Gill, famous commentator. Matthew Henry, famous commentator. Say, Michael is Jesus. Adam Clark says, quote, Michael is he who is like God, sometimes appears to signify the Messiah. John Wesley, Michael here is commonly supposed to mean Christ. I could go on. So the idea that Michael is another pre-incarnation uh, term for Christ is a very well-supported teaching in the Bible. Now here's the evidence for that. It says, Michael stands up the great prince that stands for the children of your people. Who is the great prince that stands in our behalf? That means in our defense, to intercede, to defend. That's Christ. Isn't Christ called the prince of princes? King of kings and prince of princes. It also goes on to say, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Ah, oh, I'm hogging all the scriptures. We have microphones? If you want to read 1 Thessalonians 4.16, get your hand. Somebody who will read Revelation 12, verse 7. Raise your hand. Uh, then someone who will read for me Jude 1, verse 9. Raise your hand. Okay. Who will have... What was the first one? 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Go ahead. It's off to my right here. I can't see who's got the microphone. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Revelation. Well, go ahead, read that one, James. Revelation 12.7. And there was war in the heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels. All right. Now, the dragon is the supreme leader of evil. Do we all agree with that? But he's symbolized here as a dragon. Does it make sense to you that the supreme leader of good would be who? Jesus. Does it surprise you he would be symbolized in another way too? As a commander of God's armies? All right, does somebody have 1 Thessalonians 4.16? Right here, Bertie. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right, catch that. The Lord himself will descend. For who is it that's descending? Jesus, right? The Lord will descend with the voice of an archangel, of the archangel. He has the voice of the archangel. Well, that's interesting. The greatest messenger, that's all that means. Now, did somebody else have Jude 1, verse 9? I quoted that. Are you able to get a hand right here? Said Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. All right, here Michael comes to resurrect Moses. We all know Moses is in heaven because he appears in the New Testament. Who is the resurrection? 
and the life. So he's, he, he's coming and he is... Didn't Jesus say before to the devil, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan? You shall have no other gods. And so uh, you just go through the evidence and this is uh, Christ. Furthermore, what happens when Michael stands up? Back to Daniel. Oh, you know, there's another one. Joshua 5, 13 through 15 tells us that the commander of the Lord's army, who is Michael, Joshua takes his shoes off to worship him. Do you worship an angel? The angel says, this archangel says to Joshua, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. And he worships him. You don't do that for an angel. That is Michael, that is Christ, the commander of God's army. It doesn't mean he is a cherub or a seraph. We have a book on this. You go to amazingfacts.org, a book called Who is Michael the Archangel? Lots of evidence in there, and you'll know why the commentators believe this. Okay, when it says Michael stands up, what happens? Great time of trouble. It's telling us that his intercession has ceased. You know, when a judge stands up, he pronounces a sentence, he's not listening to evidence anymore. The heavenly judgment ends. Probation closes. The plagues fall. That is the great time of trouble that is spoken of. Michael stands up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. In other words, at the conclusion of that time of trouble, the seven last plagues, God's people are delivered. Um, everyone is found in what book? Book of Life. Will somebody read for me Exodus 32.32? It's not a hard one to find. We believe that book, everyone who's found in the book, you all want to be in that book. Who has Exodus 32, 32? Over here, okay? But now please forgive their sin, for if not, then blot, the, blot me out of the book you have written. Thank you. And then again, of course, in Revelation 3, Jesus refers to his book of life. Uh, Paul refers to the book of life. There's many references to this book. I don't know that it's necessarily a big, unabridged, Webster kind of book. God somehow keeps a record of those who are His, who have had their sins erased and their names entered in the book of life because they have accepted the plan of salvation. And so God uses terminology we can understand. Okay? As a matter of fact, biblically, it's a scroll. Uh, they didn't have books the way we bind them today. And so those who are in that book... Um, they will be saved. Everyone is found written in the book. Then it goes on to tell us, at the end of this time of trouble, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Now the Bible talks about two resurrections primarily. You've got the great resurrection at the beginning of the millennium. Those that have done good, the resurrection of life. The rest of the dead live not again till the end of the thousand years. That's Revelation chapter 20. That's the wicked. But there is going to be evidently some special resurrection. Remember when Jesus said to the high priest and, and those who were involved in condemning him, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And we believe that some of those who were um, pivotal in condemning and crucifying Jesus will be raised to watch him come as conquering king. And what a contrast. That means they'll die three times, huh? Whew. You wouldn't want to be in that group. Judas may be in that resurrection. And those who have died in the faith of the third angel's message are going to come out and see the Lord coming. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. The everlasting contempt of those who condemn Christ. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Who will shine the brightest... In that day, those who have turned people to righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. They have helped others make peace with God. That's the best kind of peacemaker you could be. Not only among your brethren. They will shine like the stars forever and ever. That gives me goosebumps when I think about being an evangelist because uh, you're involved first time in trying to turn people to righteousness. See, we quote this scripture all the time to our evangelists. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Now, first of all, just running to and fro, let's face it, we are living in an age where people are running to and fro faster than they ever have been. 
Uh, and we certainly are living in a time when knowledge has increased. But more specifically, this verse is telling us about a time many will investigate comparing Scripture here and there, here a little, there a bit, little line upon line, Scripture upon Scripture, and knowledge will increase because they're going to and fro. Well, for one thing, that is also a sign of the last days. I can study so much so quickly now because of computers and the Internet, I can access information going to and fro quicker than any other time in history. And knowledge increases. We've got so much at our fingertips right now that it is, it's almost terrifying when you think about it. But people are going back and forth faster than they ever have, and knowledge has increased. We're living in the age of, you notice it doesn't say wisdom will increase. We aren't any wiser than they were back in the days of uh, Jesus, are we? Knowledge is different from wisdom. Do we all agree? I mean, there have been some very evil people. The devil he can have knowledge, but he doesn't have the wisdom of God. That is the fear of the Lord. And then as we go on, he says, shut the words until the time of the end. Knowledge will increase. In other words, the book will be opened in the time of the end. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation have come to light more in the last 200 years of the church's history than since any other time since they were composed or written. And um, so we are living in the time of the end where there's great knowledge on that. Now, um, I'm trying to read through all this and still have time to ooh get to these prophecies. I look at the clock and it always is disheartening when I see how little time I have. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood, I'm in verse 5 of chapter 12, there stood two others one on this river bank, and another on the other river bank. That happens in Daniel 10, 4 also. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall be the fulfillment of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, a times, and half a time, a time is one complete cycle of the seasons, or a year. They knew when this earth had gone around the sun once. One time was one year. A times means a pair, or a couple of years, so that's how many? Two. One and two is three. And a half. Three and a half. 1,260 days in the Jewish lunar calendar. 42 months it refers to in Revelation. This time period keeps coming up in the Bible. And isn't it interesting that the angel, with an oath, standing on both sides of the water, lifts his hand and he vows and he quotes this time again. It's a very important time. Now think about this. Why is three and a half, 42 months, 1,260 days, such an important time? How long did Jesus teach before he was crucified? From his baptism till he died, 1,260 days. The rain was shut up during the time of Elijah, 1,260 days. If you read in the book of Esther, Vashti is dethroned after a feast. The Bible says in the third year of the reign of Ahasuerus, there was a feast lasting 180 days. Keep in mind, in a Jewish year, 360 days, half of that is 180. Right? So that's simple math, you can do that. 8 and 8 is 16. 360 is 2. In the third year of the reign of Ahasuerus, you can look in the book of Esther. Feast lasting 180 days, three and a half. Then the whole book of Esther unfolds after a three and a half year period. Stephen is stoned after three and a half years of the apostolic, uh, the first time that they only went to the Jews, three and a half years. Stephen is stoned. Then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Then you've got from 538 to 1798, 1,260 prophetic years. Now, one thing I want you to notice about three, um, three and a half, it represents, numbers represent things in the Bible. Seven represents a complete cycle of time, perfect cycle. You have 40 represents what? Generation. You know, 40 years they wandered till that generation died off. Read the book of Judges. It's all divided in 20, 40, and 80. Okay? Um, 12 represents the church, leadership of the church, woman with 12 stars above her head, 12 foundations in New Jerusalem, and it's filled by 12 times 12,000, right? Three and a half, 
is an interruption of seven. It's half of seven. It's cut in the middle. In the midst of the week, he's cut off. It represents a time of resistance, persecution, apostasy. During the time of Christ's ministry, three and a half years, was he accepted or resisted? During the time of Elijah, three and a half years of famine, what's going on? He's hiding out. Jezebel's killing the prophets. They're in caves. During the time when um, 1,260 years, was it a time of open preaching of the gospel or did the church have to prophesy in sackcloth, resistance, persecution? Something else you notice is there is a death at the end of the three and a half. When did Jesus die? At the end of the three and a half. At the end of three and a half after Christ, Stephen died, first Christian martyr. At the end of the three and a half in Elijah's time, the prophets of Baal are executed. And then Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you, and he has to flee. At the end of the three and a half prophetic years, 1260, 1798, the beast receives a deadly wound. Always seems to be a death after the three and a half. And even in the book of Esther, Haman is executed. So, just to stir up your pure minds, and I think the Holy Spirit will make some of that register. Now, if we stopped here, it'd be easy. We understand three and a half. But there's two other time periods. It says here, a time, time, and half a time. I'm in verse 7. When the power of the holy people has been completely scattered. You notice, three and a half, time of persecution. All these things will be finished. Or, I'm sorry, Shattered. Although I heard, I did not understand. So don't feel bad. Daniel's having trouble understanding this. I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, you know something? I, I emailed some of my friends, and I've gotten a lot of help from some of my friends out there in studying this. Pastor Doug stands on the shoulders of other people, as uh, Newton said. There is a mirror in Daniel 12 that uh, someone brought to my attention. It says in verses 1 and 2, Michael will arise at the end of time. It says in verses 11 and 13, Daniel will rise at the end of the days. It says in verse 1 and 2, those who sleep will awake. In the end of the chapter, it says those who enter into the rest will awake. It says in the first few verses, they'll be raised for their reward. They're in the book of life. In the end of chapter 12, it says, Daniel will receive his allotted portion. He will be blessed. It talks about uh, a distress um, in verses 1 and 2, time of trouble. In the 1290, it talks about a period of distress. In verse 3, I'm showing you a mirror between the beginning and end of Daniel 12. Uh, instructors who have insight will shine brightly like the firmament. Verse 10, instructors who have insight will understand you can go to verse 4. Daniel, conceal these words, seal the book. Verse 9, these words are concealed. The words are sealed until the time of the end. Verse 4, the end of time. Um, verse 5 and 6, there are two others standing on the river. In verse 8, Daniel hears, but he doesn't understand. And finally, you know what's happening? Is There's a mirror going like this through Daniel, and you know when it reaches the middle? When the angel stretches his legs across the two waters. You don't you see a reflection in the water? And he makes a vow with his hand held to heaven. It's going like this, and it's focusing our attention on that time period of 1260 because of the reasons I told you. That time period unlocks a lot of stories in the Bible, doesn't it? 42 months in Revelation, three and a half in Daniel 12, 1260 in Revelation. Uh, there's many, many places that you can find that, and like I said, including Elijah, Stephen, Esther, it's a very prominent time period of persecution of God's people. Now, then he goes on. What will be the end of these things? Verse 9, Daniel, go your way, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many will be purified and made white and refined. There will be a special outpouring of the Spirit. But the wicked will do wickedly. Those that are just will be declared just. Those that are wicked will be declared wicked. The wicked, none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. And then he throws two time periods at us at the very end. From the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, there will be 1,290 days. 
Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days, but go your way till the end, for you will rest and rise or stand in your inheritance, your lot, at the end of the days. I'm reading two versions together here. We finished Daniel 12. Reading it. Oh boy, we haven't finished figuring it out. All right. I asked them to put a board up here. I'd like to put uh, in the studio, put up the first chart, the historic interpretation. I believe in the historic view. Does everyone hear me? What did I just say? I believe is what I wanted you to hear in the historic view uh, of Daniel. But I'm going to go on to say there may be an additional, a mere interpretation. There's many examples in the Bible where one prophecy can have a couple of interpretations that don't contradict. There's the literal, and then there's the more symbolic. When Jesus talked about the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, he also said this is a parallel for the end of the world, right? When Nathan told David, your son is going to build me a house, he not only meant Solomon, he meant Jesus, the son of David, would build a house. So look at Daniel 12 with that possibility. All right. You have the date of 508. Let me put the dates down here so I don't confuse myself. You've got 538. Yeah, that's what you got it right up there. That's the historic view. And then you've got 1798. And then you've got 1843. Now you got I almost had to do this on a board for you to understand. All right, we all know that you've got 1260 years going from 538 to 1798. Time of great darkness, persecution. Beast receives a deadly wound here. But then he says there's the 1290. Well, if you go back 1290 from 1798, now I'm not going forward, I'm going back. It comes to the first time that Clovis, the king of the Franks, French known today, converted to Christianity the Catholic version, it was becoming a political thing, and it was the first time that the church and state united and the church in Rome received an army to do their bidding. By 538, they had got rid of their three enemies, the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths, and that's when they were sort of uninterrupted in their power. So they go there, and then they say, if you go 1335 from 508, that brings you to 1843, which is where you've got... The, the great awakening, the proclaimant of uh, the second coming, it turned into the great disappointment, but there was a great religious awakening that the history books support in this time period. All right, I'm going to set this aside for a second. This is the historic view. How many of you have seen this? If you read the book by Lewis Ware, uh, Daniel the Prophet by Stephen Haskell, Uriah Smith, they all support the historic view. I believe that. Here's where I'm going out on a limb a little bit. Now, do we have room... Uh, to study these things out and wonder if there may be something additional in the future. Can we, are we allowed? Will you mind if I just share this? Now keep in mind, um, I think we need to be very careful when you do these things. First of all, I don't believe in date setting. Um, I think we need to be... Here, let me quote James White. In exposition of unfulfilled prophecy where history is not written, the student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness lest he find himself straying into the field of fancy. What I'm sharing with you now is basically just study. We need to explore, because even Daniel said there's some things I don't understand. In the Sabbath school study, the writer also says there's a lot of propositions about this. I would disrespect, I would, uh, no, I would respectfully disagree with the writer of the lesson where he says we reject any future application. I think there may be something future in Daniel 12. Let me tell you why. I'm just looking at it honestly. Daniel 12, first of all, Daniel 11 says, the time of the end, the time of the end. Then Daniel 12 says, Michael stands up. Resurrection. Great persecution. Great time of trouble. You go to the end of the chapter, Daniel, you will rest and stand in your lot at the end of the days. The whole context of everything is the great crescendo of prophecy. It's the great climax. To say that all of a sudden everything raptures back to Clovis, the king of the Franks, and what happened in 508. I, I think you can't block the prophecy there. I think you're limiting what may be there. Now, there are some quotes by the spirit of prophecy that have sometimes been misunderstood. Let me give this to you. This is from uh, the Seventh Bible Commentary, 790, yeah, seven, no, 971. Let's put that up on the screen here. The people will not have another message upon definite time. 
After this period of time, she's speaking of the 2300-day prophecy that ends in 1844. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. Now the word the is a definite article. What prophetic time is she talking about? The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Many people have used this statement and different forms of this statement to say, Ellen White said there could be no future interpretation of any prophecy. And she didn't say that. She was talking about people who kept moving the 1844 date and trying to reinterpret it. And she says, God shown me that for this prophecy, for the prophecy, there is no time period goes beyond 1844. Does that make sense? You can't honestly use this to say that there's no time prophecies beyond that. I don't think that there are time prophecy is to be part of our message even now, even what I'm going to share with you. Let's go to the next quote. Now this is a quote from uh, uh, Six Manuscript Release, page 251. One week ago last Sabbath, we had a very interesting meeting. They were dealing with a brother who is kind of off on his prophetic interpretation. Brother Hewitt from Dead River, I think that's prophetic, he's from Dead River, was there. He, he came with a message to the effect that the destruction, she begins to cite a number of his errors. Don't miss that. He came with a message to the effect that the, the destruction of the wicked and the sleep of the dead was an abomination within a shut door that a woman Jezebel, a prophetess, had brought in, and he believed was I, she said, he believed I was Jezebel, this false prophetess, that I was that woman Jezebel. We told him of some of his errors. They recite some of his past errors. That the 1335 days were ended. Wait a second here. Here she says one of this brother's past errors was that the 1335 was ended. Did, did, isn't that what it says? And numerous other errors of his. She never quotes anything positive. She's quoting the errors of his, this brother. Does that make sense? You all with me? Let's look at the next. Uh, is it true that there is no prophetic time in the future? Now I'm quoting from the Great Controversy, 640 verse 2. The voice of God is heard from heaven declaring the day and the hour of Jesus' coming. That's also in Maranatha in early writings. Now, if, if the voice of God is declaring the day and hour of Christ's coming, it hasn't happened yet. That is a prophecy. It is a time. And it is future. So you can't interpret her writings consistently to say there's nothing in the future that has to do with time. You still with me? All right, one more. July 30, 1903, letter to Daniels and Prescott. Let us read and study the 12th chapter of Daniel. It is a warning that we will need to understand before the time of the end. Future, we need to understand this. And um, so with that in mind, uh, I think that we need to be very careful in our study of these things and not be dogmatic. But were there, is it ever possible that in Daniel, does a day always represent a year in prophecy? Let's first talk about that. Daniel chapter 9 begins by Daniel reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. While I was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah that said that the children of God would be 70 years in captivity, those 70 years he refers to, are they literal or prophetic? They're literal. In Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, where seven times pass over the king. Those seven times, we've learned that a time is a year, seven times seven years. Are they literal or prophetic? Well, they're literal. We know that Nebuchadnezzar historically, I mean, there may be a prophetic and spiritual application we don't know about, but I'm not going to go there. But we know that it at least has a literal application, right? Okay. So there is a precedent that, and if that statement I read by Ellen White a little earlier, she says, prophetic time is not to apply beyond 1844. Some have wondered, does that mean we don't apply a day for a year after 1844? But a day means a day. Now, with that in mind, uh, in the studio, jump past this chart. We're going to go back to it. And I want to show, that's it. Yeah, let's show... There are many people, you keep in mind, just, and I'm not preaching heresy, I'm just trying to stir up, since our church, the jury is out on this, I think that we can share it without being heretics, right? Not being dogmatic. Everyone understand? We're praying and studying. There may be a last day meaning for Daniel chapter 12, in addition to the historical. Okay? In my office, you know how much mail I get at Amazing Facts, where people say, I've done this Bible study, I'd like to share it with you. 
I probably have had a thousand, I might be exaggerating, studies that have come to me or emails where people say, you know, I think there may be some last day application. These are good people. These are scholars in the church that think there may be some additional last day application for Daniel 12. Well, for one thing, we already know the time of trouble is that past or future. Well, there was a time of trouble during the Dark Ages, but the plagues, when is that? Future. The resurrection, past or future. Michael standing up at the judgment ending, past or future. Um, so many things we're looking at are future. Let's suppose for a second, you're going to have to look on the screen now at the chart that I'm showing. I'm not going to draw this on the board. Um, there are a number of ways I've seen this arranged, but probably the most common is, let's suppose, you've got three time periods in Daniel 12. You've got 1260. If 1260 represents a time of resistance and persecution, that would mean where a law is first made that compels us to break the law of God, sometimes called a Sunday law. Doesn't it say in Daniel they made laws that required you to break one of God's Ten Commandments? And many have believed that that will be uh, a law that will force us to break the Fourth Commandment in the last days. And during that time, there's what they call the small time of trouble. You can't buy or sell. That may go on three and a half years, a time of persecution. What often happens at the end of 1260? A death. A decree is made when they see that the people of God, and you know what, the message is going to go like wildfire during that time of persecution. Doesn't the church usually grow during those times? You look at the three and a half years of Christ's ministry and the three and a half years before Stephen was stoned, the church exploded. There's going to be a great outpouring of God's Spirit at the same time there's great persecution during that period. I don't know if it's going to be this, but it could be. Um, small time of trouble, can't buy or sell, uh, might have to flee into the country. And you're all going to come visit me in Kovalo, right? I'm going to the cave, just in case you want to know. <laughs> During that time. <laughs> and I haven't told you where that is. <laughs> but then there'll be a death decree. Now, have you noticed in the book of Esther, a death decree is made. And by the way, Ellen White says, what happened to the people of God in Esther will be repeated at the end of time. Uh, a death decree is made, and... A time period from the time the decree is made until it's implemented. You know, most governments give you a time. They say, this is the law. It will be implemented at this time. In the book of Esther, the decree is made, but it's not implemented until a future date. The shortest time period that our government typically has for implementing something is 30 days. Isn't that interesting? So that might be the time from the death decree until probation closes. During that time, you're going to have to flee into much more remote places than just the country living you might have to flee to the refuges. Um, and that would be that 30-day period. Then the 45 time is after probation closes. Michael stands up. Great time of trouble. Seven last plagues. It refers to, um, in uh, you can look at also in Joshua 14, verse 10. Uh, it speaks about the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, 45 days. How long did it take for the seven pl ten plagues to fall on Egypt? It wasn't months. It wasn't years. It was, you add it up and it's about 45 days. We're not sure because it doesn't give the time, but you just look at the scenario and uh, some plagues lasted for days, some happened quickly. There was little breaks in between when Moses went to the Pharaoh. The plagues that fell on Job, did it take years or did it happen in a short time? Revelation says all of her plagues shall come in one day. If a day equals a year in prophecy, in one day means within one year's time. And think about it, how long can the world last if people are covered with terrible sores and rivers and oceans are blood and men are being scorched with great heat and you start compounding those plagues and Jesus said, except the days be short and no flesh would be saved. Can't be a long period of time. Something else, if you look in Revelation 18, go there real quick. Is any of this making sense? Uh, we're not doing milk today, we're doing meat. Okay? Revelation 18, talking about when the beast falls, which is during the time of the plagues, you look in verse 10, standing at a distance for the fear of her torment. Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment is come. Then go to verse 17. For in one hour such great riches come to nothing. Verse 19, last part. For in one hour she is made desolate. One hour, one hour, one hour. Now, in Revelation, a day is a year in prophecy. 360 days to the Jewish year. One hour is one twenty-fourth of a day. 
Even the Bible, they said there are 12 hours in the day, 12 in the night, 24 hours in the day. 1 24th of 360 is 15. So one hour is 15 days. 3 times 15 is how much? 45. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Just something to, you know, I might just be playing with numbers, and Lord forgive me if I am. I'm sharing this by permission and not by commandment. Everybody clear? Not being dogmatic, but I just want you to think. There may be something still in the future on this. Furthermore, there's another quote that I want to read about uh, Jesus when he talks about the abomination. Oh, here we are. The abomination of desolation is mentioned here. Go back to Daniel chapter 12. From the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Well, we know about the historical fulfillment, and I believe that. But Jesus uses the abomination of desolation to also talk about the very end of time. In Matthew 24, verse 15, 14 and 15, or 15 and 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Now Christ is quoting from where? Well, he must be quoting from Daniel 12. Stand in the holy place, planting his tent between the mountains, sitting in the temple of God, making a law telling us how to worship. You with me? Let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. When Luke quotes this, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. There's a dual application. Not only did the abomination of desolation mean the Roman power historically, and they had to flee, it also meant the people of God in the last days. Let me quote from uh, the book Maranatha, page 180. This is a quote from Ellen White, in the book Maranatha, 180. The time is not far distant. When, like the early disciples, we will be forced to seek a refuge in desolate, solitary places, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation, the United States, in the decree enforcing a papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the cities preparatory to um, leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. I just showed you on this chart how that might happen. The prophecy Jesus uttered was twofold dual in its meaning. While foreshadowing the destruction of Jerusalem, it prefigured the terrors of the last great day. So she takes the abomination of desolation and puts it where? The last great day. That's not all in the past, friends. Daniel 12, I think, has something in the future. Does that make sense? To, does this make sense to you? that there may be something in the future for Daniel 12. I mean, you look at the context of it. <clears throat> look at some of the parallels between Daniel 12 and Daniel 10. Daniel 12 has a sealed book. Daniel 10, unsealed book. Daniel 12, a body of water, body of water. Solemn oath, solemn oath. Time prophecy, time prophecy. End of time, time no longer. Test and trial, future appointments. A lot of parallels. Oh, we're going to post these charts at the um, Amazing Facts Sabbath School at Central website. Some of you who watch this, if you want to download and look at them and, and uh, whatever. What I was really looking for is some of the parallels that you find. Oh, Daniel chapter 12. Who is, he says, blessed are those who make it to the 1335. Who are the blessed? Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. So at the end of the chapter of Daniel, when it says... Um, Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Daniel 12:12. 12, 12. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Is that all in the past? Because here it says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. If you go to uh, Adam Clark's commentary, it is generally thought by commentators that the termination of the last period is the epic of the first resurrection. And so you can't completely, completely sweep all this aside just by saying we reject that there could be any future application to Daniel 12 in these time prophecies. Uh, I think that may be uh, dangerous to, to shut the door like that. Something else I thought was interesting, the last time the word blessed is used in the Old Testament, the way Daniel uses, is Isaiah. Chapter 56, verse 2, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold, hold on it, who keeps the Sabbath from defiling it. So here it's calling a blessing between those who keep the Sabbath and those who are in the first resurrection in connection with the blessing in Daniel 12.12. 12. Isn't that interesting? 
the last two ways that word is used. Daniel 12 talks about the persecution of God's people. Matthew 24, persecution of God's people. Daniel 12, abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation. Um, talks about the time of trouble, almost the same language. They talk about the um, um, righteous being delivered, and I'm out of time. Anyway, a lot of interesting information. At least I made it through the chapter. Amen? But how many of you are thinking now? I'm, I'm hoping that it gave you something to think about, that uh, we are living in the last days. One more thing I wanted you to think about. There are different kinds of time prophecies in the Bible. Some prophecies give a date and say, once this date starts, then this will happen. Some time prophecies just tell how long something's going to be. That's the kind of prophecy this is. God never told the children of Israel exactly when they were going to Babylon. He just said, when you go, you'll be there 70 years. These prophecies are telling about when the end begins, this is how long it's going to last. You understand what I'm saying? And once probation closes, we may as well know the day and the hour, right? Because the saved to save, the lost are lost, it won't make any difference. And that's why she says that uh, the day and the hour is heard in the heavens. So, oh, I wish I had more time. Thank you for uh, bearing with me.